the redeemed of the Lord say so. Tell about the way he brought you out from darkness into light. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Tell about the love he shows to you each and every day. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he receive the promise of the Spirit, the promise of the Spirit. He has redeemed us so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit, the promise of the Spirit. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Tell about the hope of his return when we will rise with him. Let the redeemed of the Lord, let the redeemed of the Lord, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. This is hope. Ground. It's true. We're standing on holy ground. For the Lord is present, and where he is, is holy. This is holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. For the Lord is present, and where he is, is holy. You know the second verse? These are holy hands. He's given us holy be true. These are holy hands. He's given us holy hands. Mm. He works through these hands and so these hands are holy. These that he has given us holy lips he speaks through these lips and so these lips are holy these are holy lips he's given us holy lips 
these words aren't on the screen, but just before we go to prayer, let's sing. We, we are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all Just as we prepare our hearts to pray for various needs to enter our assembly as well as for our community at large, for those of you who are here as well as those of you who are viewing by Facebook and YouTube, last night I was out for just a little ride on my bike. It's an old vintage bike with an old bike horn that goes, ar, ar, ar. <laughs> sounds like a goose with a cold. <laughs> Well, as, as has started to happen as I ride through, the, through the, the various streets, the kids from the various homes uh, see me coming, and they've got used to the horn. And last night was no exception. I rode three times around the block, and every time there was more kids that came out from houses. So I had to stop, and they all wanted to, they all wanted to honk the horn. A lot of kids have never seen anything like that before, and they would giggle and laugh, and off they would run, and we had so much fun, and grandparents would come out, and, and most of them couldn't speak English, but we could smile at each other. You know, the Lord taught me something that I think just fits so beautifully into this moment, this sacred, holy moment. Is that as I came around, it was like those kids just came, and they were so delighted, so happy. And I thought to myself, I was reminded again this morning, just as we we're worshiping, when we come before the Lord, he isn't standing back with folded arms saying, well, it's nice to see you. I, I picture him as a holy father who is so delighted that we, his children, have come, has come. It's like he comes running to us saying, I'm so glad you're here. You're my children. I love you. This morning as we pray, in effect, that's what we're doing. We're coming to the Father. And he isn't this mean and nasty, stubborn God who has this frown on his face, if we could put, picture him that way. No, he is he's welcoming us with open arms, and he's so excited to see us, to be with us. Why? Because he loves you and he loves me. I don't understand that. I can't fully comprehend that. But the truth is still the same. It's unchanging. God loves you this morning and, and may you be encouraged. May you be encouraged that God smiles upon you and loves you deeply. And as we come to him before in prayer, He's just waiting now for us to bring our needs and petitions before him. And as we pray together, can we just unite our hearts quietly where we are and unite together? Maybe some of these needs don't impact you directly, but they do someone. And so as the Bible says, we are to pray one for another. And so let's do that in obedience to the word of God this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for the beautiful songs that we've sung and been reminded that you're a holy God, you're a beautiful God, an amazing God, almighty God who just breathed the universe, said a single, as it were, a word, and, and it was, and is, and, and shall ever be, all because of you, and yet as mighty and as glorious and as great as you are, 
just as those little children came as I, <laughs> as I rode around the, the block last night, it was so wonderful to see their joy on their faces over something as simple as that little bike and that horn. Uh, <laughs> I was reminded that, God, you delight in us. Your word reminds us that we are made in your image. You created us to have fellowship with you. And so as we come to you uh, with our needs and our petitions, you welcome us and, and you receive us and you listen and you are touched by these needs. And not only that, you, you are ever present and ever ready to work on behalf of those that just need your hand upon their lives. There are those that were, are within our midst here at Taylor Seminary this morning. Those that are viewing online that have, have gone through uh, grief, are so even presently, lost dear ones in, in the last weeks and months. And, and I just sense that just, Father God, you are reminding us again that you are with us in the midst of our sorrow. You're right there. And may, Father, if there are those that are, are really in that place of, of just needing your peace and your comfort to descend into their lives even now, we pray that you will, you will just, you will presence yourself with them in such a special way throughout this service, throughout this day, throughout this week, if you should tarry your coming, that, Lord God, they will know that they are in your hands and you care for them and you love them, you delight in them. Father God, we know that over this period of COVID, there have been different ones who have, have really suffered financial loss and need financial relief. There are those that are underemployed, those that have lost their employment, those that even representative in our church and those online, we pray in the name of Jesus, you who know even the needs of the tiny birds of the air and supply, Lord, we pray that you will miraculously provide employment, provide means for a roof over heads, food on the table, that, Lord God, you will be mighty and glorious, and that those that are looking even now for employment, that, Father, you will provide for them miraculously. Nothing short of miraculous, we pray. We know many have been touched in their physical bodies, and we continue to remember those within our assembly. We think of Catherine and Jan and Jerry and Julie and those that have been touched by this terrible disease that are suffering within some of our extended care homes and retirement homes here within the city. We've heard of just recent cases this week. And Lord God, we just pray in the name of Jesus that you will protect those ones. May there be no loss of life. We pray that health and strength will return in ailing bodies. We pray in the name of Jesus. Thank you that you're our healer. We look to you this morning for physical provision of health and strength. Lord God, we pray for and thank you for those that within our assembly and in the, within our community that continue to work on the front lines, our health care workers, our education uh, personnel, those that are in the food industry and transportation. We have really grown to love these people because we realize how important they are in the whole fabric of things. And sometimes we've taken for granted these individuals. But we thank you, Lord, for those even within our assembly and those that are watching this morning. May they be reminded how deeply loved and appreciated they are. Continue to keep them safe and protect them as they go about their daily work, we ask. Lord Jesus, we pray again for, for Dorothy. We know that this ongoing challenge of this unsolved crime of the taking of her daughter's life, Jolene, has now persisted for nine plus years. And even as CTV is going to be running her story, the 12th and 13th of this month, we ask that as the general public watch that story, that it will generate new clues for our police officers. We pray that, Lord God, that this unsolved crime will be solved, charges placed, that whomever or whoever has been responsible for the taking of this precious life will be held accountable and that justice will be served in the name of Jesus. 
We ask the Lord God that you'll continue to presence yourself with Dorothy, your dear mother. The Lord God, you'll bring comfort and peace to her heart. For the loss continues to, to be deep and her woundedness continue. Even these many years later, may she continue to know the love of the Lord and the love of the people of God as we surround her with our care as well. Lord, we know that these things are important to you. and We continue to bring these things before you. Thank you now, Lord God, for the many unspoken needs that are represented here this morning. Those that are watching online that perhaps cannot share those things because of personal matters. But Lord God, you know, you see all things. We ask that you, in your wonderful and mighty way, will bring a, a sense of your mighty power into those circumstances and situations. We thank you now, Lord God, for you are in control. You are sovereign, and we continue to look to you. Thank you for hearing us this morning. Thank you for being touched by our needs. Thank you, Lord God. We leave them now in your care. For the scripture reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 5, cast all your care, all your care upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Thank you that we've been able to do that, and we'll continue to do that. And we'll look to you for provision and we'll give you all the thanks. Even in advance of the fact, before we even see the answer to our prayers, we say thank you. Thank you, Lord God, as faith is expressed in and out of our lives. Continue to walk with us now through this service. We'll give you all the praise and thanks in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Would you turn to your neighbor and would you say to them, God loves me just the way I am. <laughs> Would you do that? God loves me just the way I am. Hallelujah. <laughs> and may I add that he wants to take us from where we are to where he wants us to be. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Well, we, we want to say thank you again, each and every one of you, for taking time to be with us here at Taylor Seminary on site. It's such a delight to be gathered together like this. Isn't this on a Sunday? What a privilege this is. What an absolute privilege it is to be gathered together and with one another. And I keep thanking the Lord as pastor of this church for the health that he's given us. We've met together now for four months uh, like this after reconvening after the COVID, I call it the lockdown. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I got to tell you, I, I don't take it for granted one bit, and I know you don't as well. It's God's provision, and we do thank him so, so very much. And for those of you who are joining with us by way of face to, uh, Facebook and YouTube, we also thank you from wherever you are for taking time out of your day. I noted last week it was interesting that we had a visitor from North Ireland. I think, Jennifer, that was your dear sister that was joining with us. And we would be surprised, I know, of the many people that uh, tune in every Sunday and join with us on church, with church. And God bless you if you are here or elsewhere. God bless you. Again, if you desire to give and worship the Lord through your tithes and offerings, the availability is there for you. A container at the back. For those that are here and for those of you who are online, you can go to our website, heritagevalleyassembly.com, and you can follow through the links. Amen, amen. I know you're smiling underneath those masks. I can tell. You're going, Pastor Larry, how is that possible? You know, when we smile, our eyes, our eyes just seem to project that. And I can tell. Uh, we, aren't you grateful for the beautiful weather that God has given us? He, and I could handle this for another two months, couldn't you? <laughs> Snow could fall on Christmas Eve. Until then, I'm fine with this weather. Wouldn't it be great if we, if we could? But nevertheless, we're grateful for every day. For this is the day that the Lord hath made, and we will rejoice in him. Praise the Lord. Well, we started uh, last week with a new uh, teaching series entitled Finding Joy, a study of the book of Philippians, one of the most joyful books in all of Scripture. And... Uh, we talked about the joy that comes through fellowship and being together uh, as friends and family, as a family of God, joy through community. Today, I'm, I've asked if Pastor Matthew would share with us part two of this wonderful series that we're beginning. 
And uh, he's entitled it, Finding Joy, Joy in Adversity. Joy in Adversity, as we look at Philippians chapters 1, uh, verses uh, 12 through 26. And so uh, we welcome Pastor Matthew as he comes at this time, as he shares the word of God with us. God bless you, Matthew. You're the best. May the <laughs> Lord bless you as you share the word with us this morning. How's everyone doing? Are you guys getting sick of wearing these masks yet? <laughs> oh, I find them so annoying how they fog up my glasses all the time. Oh, my goodness. Sometimes it's hard to see. I bang into walls. and It's like walking in the middle of the night. You know, when you're trying to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, and you're feeling around like that. It's sometimes like that when your glasses fog up. It's like, oh, boy, I'm going to get into an accident. But, <laughs> well, as Pastor Larry said, we're continuing on in this series uh, that we started last week on finding joy, a study in Philippians, and today, yes, joy through adversity, joy through adversity. So before we start off in this, it, it, um, or continue on in this letter here uh, in verses 12 to 26, uh, let me just give a, a little bit of a background uh, so we know the context, so we know what's going on here, so we know why Paul wrote this. As you can see on the map there, there's Europe, well this is modern day Europe, but um, there we go. That's where Paul is writing from. Paul is writing from, in prison, uh, from Rome, in prison, under house arrest. Many scholars believe that he was in house arrest. And there is Philippi in Greece. And of course there is Israel, Jerusalem there. And so he's writing to people who are in Philippi. Now, Paul planted this church at around A.D. 49, on his second missionary journey, when he was with Silas, Timothy, and Luke. In Acts 16, verse 9, it tells us that, Luke had, or that Paul had a vision to go to Macedonia, which is where Philippi is. And when he got there, there was a, he met a lady by the name of Lydia. And this is found in Acts 16, verse 12. And she is the very first person to receive Christ there in Philippi. And the rest is history. Uh, Christianity spreads in that area. And by the time A.D. 110, Polycarp, one of the, one of the second century uh, church fathers, wrote a letter to the church in Philippi and said this, The secure root of your faith being proclaimed from ancient times still continues and bears fruit to our Lord Jesus Christ. So with knowing this, it's clear that this church uh, wasn't going through major difficulties. They, you know, it, it, they were doing really good. Praise God. This church was doing wonderful. So, so when Paul was writing his letter, he had nothing to worry about. He had nothing to call them out on, to, 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 to um, uh, rebuke uh, certain things, like, like we've seen in other certain letters, like Galatians and uh, Corinthians. So Paul had nothing to worry about, and as Pastor Larry pointed last week, this is, this is his joyful letter to this church. And in this chapter, this chapter here, chapter 1, he focuses a lot on joy. But when you think about it, okay, Paul is in prison in Rome. How can he be joyful? You would think about that, you know, you think like, how is jail joyful? It's like major timeout. Who likes being in timeout or being in detention? Nobody. <laughs> like, and, and, but yet, he's joyful. Now, when I think of jail, when I think of the word jail, or as I see a picture of a jail, do you know what crosses my mind first off? Get me out of here! Like, I don't want to be here. Like, I don't know. I do not want to go to jail. Man, I would cry like a baby if I was in jail, I tell you. Um, I think of being restricted contained, you know, uh, I'm having your freedom stripped away. It's boring. Uh, I, I, you know, I mean, like, I mean, uh, Paul, he couldn't even, uh, he wasn't able to go outside, you know, on a hot, nice hot day and go and get some ice cream down, down on, on the corner shop, you know what I mean? Or, or, or go and, and, and get, get a nice candy bar. You know, he wasn't able to leave his house. He had to stay there. He was under house arrest. And most of all, he couldn't continue on in his missionary journey. How can one be joyful in this? When I think of jail, I also think of Cool Hand Luke, Paul Newman, Cool Hand Luke, or, 
or Clint Eastwood in Escape from Alcatraz, or my personal favorite, uh, The Great Escape. I think of stuff like that. And you know, the thing that, that these movies have in common is that the person or persons desires to be free because they are contained in a space that they want to break out of and they are unhappy. And so they, they, in these movies, they escape. They escape in them. Of course, one of them is not successful, but they escape. Well, and one of them is half successful. But <laughs> and yet, we see Paul here um, happy. He's in, he seems to be enjoying himself. And you would think, is Paul a little sick here? Maybe he's not thinking straight. Now remember, this is not the first time Paul has been in prison. Paul was actually in prison in the city of Philippi, the very city that he's writing to. In Acts chapter 16, verses 22 to 36, Paul and Silas were both in prison. And they were, they were, they're, they're, they're shackled in there, and they're stuck in prison, and they stayed there all night, weeping and mourning and wailing out loud that this is miserable, this is miserable. No, they didn't do that. Come on, don't listen to me. No, they were, they were singing hymns. They were, they, they, they were praising God. They were praying. And then it says in Scripture that suddenly there was an earthquake and the shackles came off of them, but they didn't leave. They stayed there. And the jailer, he came. He thought they escaped. He was about to, he was about to thrust the sword into himself and then all of a sudden, he, you know, uh, Paul and Silas call out, and, and he comes over, and then, then the jailer says, what must I do to be saved? Wonderful story. And then Paul, Paul says, repent of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. I love it. And so many years later, Paul is in prison again, but in Rome under house arrest. Let's go through verses 12 26, we're going to break this down here. So uh, let's, let's start at verse 12 here. Verse 12. That's a mistake. It should be 12 to 14, but let's read it here. If you've got your Bibles, uh, uh, you, you can follow along, or you can follow along the screen. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the, the whole imperial guard that to all and to the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of, uh, of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What in the world? <laughs> Paul, what are you saying? Amazing. Two main reasons why his imprisonment helped further the spread of the gospel. Let's look at this first one here. So that it, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all to all the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now think about this. Paul's under house arrest. He has a guard who's watching over him. What a perfect opportunity to reach the unreachable. Someone that Paul could not reach before, now he can reach him because now this guard has to stay and he can't arrest him. He's already arrested already. And so... I, I can just imagine, you know, the guard, you know, I don't know, he'd probably be outside of his doorway, you know, just, you know, there with a spear or whatever. And Paul's opening up the door, woo -hoo, you know, just like, hey, 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 how, how's, how's, how's it going? It's a nice day out today, huh? Hey, did, 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 you, did you know my story? Did you know what I used to do? I used to kill Christians. I used to hunt them down and, and I, I, just, I used to slander them. And then all of a sudden one day Jesus appeared before me and I was blind and Christ talked to me. And then, I, then three days later, I was, my sight was restored, and I started doing the exact thing. I started doing the exact opposite thing. I serve Christ now. Amazing testimony that would be. Telling this guard your whole testimony, and Paul would be able to do that. And of course, as he said, known throughout the imperial guard, because there would be a changing of guard every now and then. And so that guard would go away and probably go to, you know, to his family, like... Hey, you know, you want to hear the weirdest thing? I had a, I have such a weird prisoner today. You want to hear this story? It's, it's weird, but it really touches my heart. Like, you know, you can kind of imagine something like that. And, and then second thing, second thing, second thing is here. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. 
So because of Paul's imprisonment, other brothers in the faith have been encouraged. Why? Because of Paul's eagerness for the gospel message, he is willing to go all the way to be put in prison. All the way to be, to be uh, 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 even to, to be sentenced to death. Paul doesn't care. What matters is, is the gospel, gospel message. message. And, and so, so when other, other brothers and sisters, sisters see this, they, they, you know, they, they hear about Paul, Paul, and Paul, and I know, like, like he, he doesn't, doesn't care, and he's doing it all out for, for, for Christ, Christ, you know? You, you see, see that, that, and they're like, like, wow, that's, that's really encouraging. encouraging. I, I should do the same as well, as Paul would often say, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so this would encourage other believers to do the same thing. As well, Paul is not afraid of jail or death. Doing service for the Lord, no matter what the cost, is truly joyful. Truly joyful. No matter what the outcome is, it is rewarding. And then let's look at this. Verses 15 to 18. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, uh, not, not sincerely, uh, but, but thinking to inflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Now this is very interesting. Paul is actually okay with this. They're preaching Christ, but they have hearts of envy and, and, and strife, or, uh, or the other word we see here is rivalry. They proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. Why isn't Paul rebuking them? Now, I'm sure, I'm sure all of you would agree here, you would find it discouraging when, when someone maligns you, uh, especially when it comes from the body of Christ. And, and someone mocks you or criticizes you very harshly and slanders you, you know, slanders what you're doing and stuff and tries to, you know, make things up, stuff like that. Paul faced uh, even division. He, he faced in the church in, in uh, Corinth. He, he faced uh, types of slander. Remember, Paul rebuked them because there was people who were saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Peter. There was a division, and so Paul rebuked them. Paul even rebuked those in Galatia who were adding to the gospel, and he said that they are anathema, they are accursed. So what about these? Why isn't Paul rebuking them? Most likely because they are not adding to or taking out or twisting the gospel in any shape, way, or form. They are preaching the true gospel, and not a different gospel, not a strange gospel. And also, they weren't false prophets or false apostles or, or deceivers trying to deceive people. They were, they were preaching Christ. Uh, the vessels were a little flawed, yeah, the vessels were a little flawed, but their message was true. So that's very interesting. Now, this probably shocked Luke or uh, Timothy, you know, when they came to, to tell him about this. You know, and they, they would probably sit there and tell Paul this, and they're like, oh, Paul's not going to be happy. You know, he's going to rebuke them, and I'm going to have to write a letter to them, or something like that, you know what I mean? Or, and they probably would have been shocked. They're like, Paul, like, did, did you hear what I just said? Like, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, you sometimes think about stuff like that. You sometimes wonder. But Paul says that these men were preaching out of envy and strife. So let, let, let's look at the, these two words, envy and strife, especially the word envy. What exactly were, is envy? Well, it is envy that caused the Pharisees and the chief priests to hand over Jesus to Pilate because of envy, it says in Scripture. Envy is also listed uh, in, the, in the long list of ungodliness and unrighteousness in Romans uh, Romans 1.9, oh, oh, it goes on and on. There's a lot of scripture there. We see it there. Now, these people probably envied Paul because of his gifts, his blessings, his smarts, his successful ministry. They probably envied Paul as well because he was famous in, in so many churches. 
And because he planted so many churches, they wanted to do what he was doing. They were envious of it. They're like, oh, I, I, I want that for myself. And they were probably also envious as well because he had such incredible encounters with Christ. And even that, he, he, he saw heaven at, at one point. From this, naturally, rivalry or strife would come about as well. These people would try to hurt Paul. And so maybe they were making up things like maybe they were saying, you know, Paul's in prison because he sinned against God. You know, and they, maybe they were spreading I don't know, just assuming here. Who knows what they're doing, but Paul's response to all of them is, it's basically like, um, I don't care. As long as Christ is being proclaimed, uh, is being properly proclaimed, you know, the true gospel message, then I rejoice in that, even if they try and slander me and, and whatever. Really is truly amazing. When I read this, I studied it from different commentaries going back and forth. It's just like, hmm, it's interesting. Now, let's read the last part here. I love this title, To Live is Christ. Hallelujah. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all that I, will be, that I will not be at all ashamed. Be that with, with full coverage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by, left, by, by, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor, fruitful labor for me. Yet, we, yet which I shall... Yet... Which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and, and to be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to, glor to, gl uh, to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Now this is where the whole thing of having joy through adversity really comes to its peak here in Paul's writing here. Now there are some people who think that the Apostle Paul is being suicidal. No, he's not being suicidal. He's not suicidal at all. Paul uh, is he, Paul's just showing that he doesn't care about death. He's not afraid of death. He's not afraid... To die. Why should he? If he dies, he's with Christ. There's no more pain, no more suffering. Praise the Lord. That has nothing, this has nothing to do with being suicidal. In no way, Paul is not trying to kill himself. You have to understand, Paul knows that he could very well be, even though he's under house arrest, he could still be sentenced to death right there. And so Paul is just thinking in his head, he's just thinking, if he had a choice, if he had a choice, what would it be? So here are different pros and cons. If Paul died, if Paul lived. If Paul died, pros are he lives as a martyr and imitates Christ in doing so. He would be instantly with Christ. No more pain and no more sadness, guilt, so on. The con is though, uh, those who need Paul uh, they would no longer have him and he would no longer be an incredible witness to the Jews and the Gentiles. But if he lives, the pros are he can carry on and see much fruit. He can further ad advance the kingdom and continue training the next generation. But the cons are he will be absent from Christ, from his physical body, and, and, and his continual presence in heaven. He, he won't have that. And there will be more persecution. Well, that was, I thought that was spelled wrong. There will be more persecution. And so Paul realizes that. He knows that. And so, as Paul is writing this out, as Paul is writing this out, he knows the answer. He knows the answer. He's not like writing it out like, hmm, what should I do? No, he actually knows the answer. He's just, the reason why he's writing it this way is because he's showing the church there that, you know, he's showing how difficult of a decision this would be if, if he actually had to make up his mind. So he's showing that. He's writing that out so people can see. And, but he chooses to live and to suffer more for Christ. Incredible. And, and as we remember, Paul had to face a lot more hardships, and he has already faced a lot of hardships already. 2 Corinthians eleven twenty four 
says this, five times, five times I received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day adrift at sea on, on frequent journeys in, da in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, and apart from, 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 from the other things, there is the daily, daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. This is what Paul has already faced in his life and ministry, and yet Paul is saying, I am willing to keep going, to keep pressing in for the sake of the gospel, for the cause of Christ. Then I, Paul, I know Paul would say I, he would be willing to do it all over again just for the cause of Christ to see salvations. That's Paul's heart. Now, there's a few applications from this. Three applications I, 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 I looked through here and I found. Applications. First application is pick your battles. Pick your battles in life. Now, we see that in Paul. Paul picked his, you know, he could have easily rebuked the, the, those brothers who, who were sharing Christ out of envy and strife. You know, he could have easily done that, but he didn't. You know, you often hear this, and my mom, my mom often says this to me, is that a hill you really want to die on? You know? Uh, I know for myself, from my personal self, I used to be against every Christian who drank alcohol. I used to be like, you know, I mean, you'd be totally against them if they drank alcohol. And I used to try and debate them and stuff like that. Now, I choose not to drink for three reasons. Obviously, I have credentials with PAOC. I'm not allowed to drink, and I will not drink. Number two, uh, I have an addictive personality about me. And, and so I, can, I know I can easily be overcome by it. Number three, there have been many alcoholics in my extended family. Not my immediate, but extended family. And so that's probably where I get that addictive personality from. But over time, the Lord has showed me, the Lord has showed me uh, slowly over time that it's actually not that big of a deal. Unless, of course, obviously, unless you sin in getting drunk. You know, if, if, if you're not sober-minded, that, that, that's wrong. Uh, scripture, uh, um, is, is, scripture speaks very much against that, getting drunk. That's wrong. So I'm not against people if they just casually take a drink. That's fine. Just don't be overcome by it. And this can be applied to other things of life, you know, choosing your battles to fight on. For instance, I, I have sometimes run, run across people who have gotten upset with me because I, I love dinosaurs. I, I watch Jurassic Park, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Come on, come on dinosaurs eating these people. Ah, you know, <laughs> that, 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 that's just me. I love Jurassic Park. Um, I love Lord of the Rings, you know, Star Wars. I'm a big, you know, people, some people know me as a Star Wars nerd. I even got a lightsaber. Like, but, and I've had some people who have confronted me and they said, that that's wrong. What you're doing is wrong. You know, I mean, stuff like that. And you got to be careful how we pick our battles. Got to be careful how we pick our battles because we become legalistic. Um, my, my mom, she grew up where you weren't allowed to go to a movie theater at all. If you went to a movie theater and the rapture happened, you know, you wouldn't be able to, you would just bounce off the ceiling. You would just, your body would just be floating up there. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to escape to reach Christ, you know. And they, they, you weren't allowed to wear makeup or earrings or, or even touch cards at all because it was gambling and, uh, or go to bowling alleys or play pool, you know. Um, that's where legalism comes in. And we gotta be, we always got to watch ourselves of that. So watch which battles you pick. And if you do confront someone, like, for instance, if someone's watching something seriously demonic, obviously horror movies, like a lot of them today, which are very demonic, or something pornographic, yes, confront them. Yes, do it. But always, always do it in private. Always do it in private first, as we see in Matthew 18, 15 to 17. Private first, and if... If, if you talk to them, you try to reason with them, and they're like, ah, oh, your mom wears army boots, get out of here. You know, I mean, they don't want to listen. And then you go back, you bring one or two people with you then. 
And then if that doesn't happen, well, then you, you make it more public. But that's laid out in Scripture there in Matthew 18. Pick your battles. Number two, number two takeaway. Rejoice in the gospel and what the Lord is doing. Paul rejoiced, even though they were, they, 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 they were preaching out of envy and strife, and yet he rejoiced in what they were doing because they were presenting the true gospel. And this is what Paul did. Um, oftentimes, I, 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 this saddens my heart so often, <clears throat> when, you know, we got different denominations. We got different denominations. Sometimes we think of them as like, uh, like walls, like, you know, the, the Iron Curtain. You know what I mean? Like separating us churches. And we cannot. It's, it's verboten. You know what I mean? We can't go to the other side or, or to mingle with other believers. It, just because we have differences in certain things, uh, like, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be mingling. If they proclaim Christ, the full gospel message, then hallelujah, praise the Lord. It doesn't matter if they, if they denounce the gifts of the Spirit, even if they think, um, uh, like, I'm demonic, that I speak in tongues. I've heard of that before. I still call them my brother. They preach the gospel message, hallelujah. Or even if their eschatolo uh, 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 eschatology is different, if they believe in pre-trib or post-trib or no trip at all, or that we're in the thousand-year reign of Christ right now and things are getting better and there's no antichrist. As long as you preach the gospel message, hallelujah, I rejoice in that. And people get saved through that. Bless the Lord. Or even if the person believes in evolution and believes that God created a bunch of monkeys and then the monkeys gave birth to Adam and Eve, which is what they actually believe. Oh, a major pet peeve of mine. This is not a hill to die on. This is not a hill to die on, Matthew. I rejoice if they preach the full gospel message and people get saved. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. What matters is the gospel. Seeing people get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and hearing the gospel message, you should never ever get tired of hearing the gospel message. Even if you hear it a hundred thousand times, you should always just... Be excited. Get goosebumps. Get chicken skin on you. You know what I mean? You, you just get excited when you hear the gospel being proclaimed. Now, this part that I'm going into, this is kind of a rabbit trail, but it's not. It does connect. But I, as I was typing this out, I very much felt the Holy Spirit leading me in this way. Sometimes we get caught up in negatives that we see in churches. This, as you see, it connects. Uh, and, and moves of God, revivals, and stuff like that. And, and as a sad thing, we, we sometimes highlight the negatives, and we put down all the positives. The negatives highlight a, a, as the big, like, oh, it's bad. We shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, I remember Pastor Lair always teaching me this, eat the meat, spit out the bones. Every revival, every move of the Holy Spirit, there has always been negatives, always been negatives. Sometimes bigger than others, but the Lord always, you always worked mightily in those places. This really, really shouldn't surprise us because uh, of seeing the negatives. Because if the Spirit of the Lord is really, truly moving in a meeting, in a church, in a city, then we should expect to see the devil amongst them as well, trying to distract people, trying to bring up the flesh, trying to bring up some heretical thing or something like that try and get people to slither around like a snake or something like that, we should expect to see those type of things. And yes, we must, we must denounce them, absolutely. But we shouldn't shy away and be scared when we see a move of the spear going on. That, 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 that just happens. Those things happen. It's the same thing when you find counterfeit money. You hear of counterfeit money. Why do they counterfeit money? Because it's real. It's the real McCoy. It, the real thing, you want to try and copy it. You, that's what the devil likes to do. He likes to copy certain things. I've seen many fleshly things in revival meetings, and I still love going to them, by the way. But I've seen them. I've seen people getting, you know, like, you know, whatever, different things. But I want the genuine, and I've seen the genuine. The same, the same principle of counterfeit money can be applied to churches as well. <sighs> Some may be harder to find, but if you study throughout all church history, you will find them in every move of God. And then there is this. Oftentimes we get solely sideswiped by things that we don't understand. And so we immediately slap a label and say, 
demonic or flesh or counterfeit. But oftentimes our hearts deceive us. Did you know, did you know that when Becca and I, my wife, when we were first dating, our first month into dating, we were praying together and I spoke in tongues and she was going to break up with me because of that. Did you know that? Don't worry, I got permission from her from this. Yeah, she was going to break up with me because she told me because she did not feel right in her spirit about it. She did not feel right about it. She, she was like, this is not good. This is not right. Now, does that mean I was acting in the flesh or faking it or speaking in demonic tongues? No. I was truly worshiping. I, I, was, I, was, I was praying. Now, obviously she didn't break up with me because the, the, God did an amazing thing in her life. She, she, she encountered God. But we have to be careful of this. We can sometimes get our heart slash spirit feeling mixed up with spiritual discernment. Did you know that the first great awakening, when it happened, people denounced it, saying uh, that it, it, it was demonic, it, it was heretical, stuff like that, because people were being slain in the spirit. People were laughing, weeping, and screaming, and shouting, and jumping, and dancing. And they said that, you know, that, that it, was, it, it was demonic, it was flesh, it was fake. All because they had never experienced it, and they've never seen it before. It was totally new. It was totally foreign to them. And they even said, where is that in the Bible? I, I, Matthew Pipke, Pastor Matthew, used to mock and scoff many different things, many different moves and stuff, uh, moves of the Spirit. I used to say it was fake, it was flesh, it was demonic. And then over time, I slowly started experiencing those things. And I knew it was God because it drew me closer to Christ. I saw the fruit of it. That is key. Recognize if there is fruit. Now, obviously, I, yes, it can be faked. And, I, and I, I've seen it many times, like I said. I know there is the flesh. There is the demonic out there. But it, it, it is totally wrong for us to think that God can only move in this certain cube, this certain box, and that God can never move outside of it. We are putting God in a box. Why would we do that? God can do anything He wants, even if that means doing something totally new that we do not see in Scripture or something that's not clarified in Scripture. Obviously, we should be hesitant, absolutely, but pray about it. Be careful not to get your heart and discernment mixed up and see what kind of fruit lies afterwards. Does it draw the person closer to Christ? And, or, 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 or does it draw them into a false gospel or something like that? Then it should be denounced. Thirdly, last one, this is a short one now. Put your eyes on Jesus, don't be afraid of death or persecution. Paul was not afraid of dying, of going to jail for Christ. If you are serious about Christ, you will count the cost. You will count the cost. Dietrich Bonhoeffer often talked about this. The, 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 the cost of discipleship, going all the way for Jesus. If Jesus calls you to a certain place around the world, and you know it's a dangerous place, would you still go if he called you? You cannot negotiate with God. God, God. God will not negotiate with you. Are you willing to pay the price of following after Christ? What if the government shuts down our church? What if persecution gets get so strong where we can't meet in here anymore and we have to meet in the basement? Would you still follow Christ? What if you are jailed for following Christ, for proclaiming that Jesus is the only way for salvation, would you, be, would you be willing to go to jail? I would. Absolutely. Whatever for the cause of Christ. And I, of course, I'm just saying that right now, but I, I, I believe I would. That's something we must think about and something that is very sobering when we read of Paul in Philippians chapter 1, that Paul is joyful and he would, he would do all you do whatever it takes for the cause of Christ. And you, you choose to be joyful in his circumstances. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for today, Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray, O oh God, that you would move upon our hearts, Holy Spirit. That God, you would speak to us. Speak to us, Lord. Lord, take us wherever you want us to go that we would be unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We wouldn't care of the cost. Lord, it is truly worth it. Whatever it is, wherever we have to go, it is worth it, Lord. 
I pray, Lord, that we would never be ashamed, never be afraid of standing for you and the gospel, the true gospel message. In Jesus' name, amen. And Father God, we thank you for the word today. We thank you that we are reminded that whatever adversity or tests or challenges that even we may be experiencing right now in our lives, or that may come, that like Paul, we can be able to say, you can bring us to that point if we aren't already, we, we can come to that place that regardless of the circumstances, that we could be filled with joy that passes all understanding. May that be our portion today, Lord, as we go into our week and from this place, this holy place, this sacred place, may we know the joy of the Lord. May the joy of the Lord be our strength. And Father God, we, we pray now that you will go with us. And now may the Lord bless you, my dear friends. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you and give you peace and joy in the midst of all that comes, the good and the challenging of life, may we, may we walk assuredly in Christ Jesus, for who is in Christ alone our strengths. We put our trust. Go with us now. We thank you for this time together. And in your word and song and celebration together, we are so thankful. Bless us now. Keep us in your good care. Keep us safe as we go throughout this week. May we be blessed, yes, in order to be a blessing to others. We pray in Jesus' wonderful and precious name. Amen and amen. Now may you go in the strength of the Lord. and Greet one another before you head off today. Would you do that? Take time to, to uh, extend thanks and your gratitude to one another. God's good, isn't he? God bless you. Go in the joy of the Lord. Amen? Amen, amen. Praise the Lord.